Um, I am more than excited to um, welcome our speaker today, Dr. James Collins. Um, so Dr. James Collins is a neonatologist and professor of pediatrics at Northwestern University's Feinberg School of Medicine. Um, he's the medical director of the neonatal, neonatal intensive care unit and the associate program director of the pediatric residency program at Lurie Children's Hospital of Chicago. He's a leading scholar on the epidemiology of racial inequities and adverse birth, birth outcomes, having published over 90 manuscripts in the area. In particular, his contributions to advancing our understanding of the social determinants of health and racism in the context of shaping and perpetuating these inequities have been recognized by his receipt of numerous distinguished awards, including the Duane Alexander Award for Academic Leadership in Perinatal Medicine from the National Institutes of Child Health and Development, and most recently, the William Silverman Lectureship Award from the American Academy of Pediatrics. He has also leveraged this extensive expertise in racial inequities and perinatal outcomes to serve on several advisory groups, including the Partnership to Eliminate Disparities in Infant Mortality, which was a joint partnership between City Match, AMCHIP, and the National Healthy Start Association, as well as serving as the chairperson for the Department of Health and Human Services Secretary's Advisory Committee on Infant Mortality. And while it's always an honor to welcome such a distinguished scholar, scholar to our UHC speaker series, it's particularly meaningful uh, for me today because as a budding epidemiologist during my doctoral training, Dr. Collins's work was pivotal in helping me wrap my head around the intersection between neighborhood, racism, res residential mobility in relationship to perinatal health inequities. His work on intergenerational transmission of these outcomes and characterization of mobility trajectories were really the inspiration for me, myself, to, in to investigate longitudinal exposures to neighborhood deprivation and relationship to maternal, maternal health outcome, which remains not only a, a cornerstone of my research, but also a very much a passion of the work that I do both in research, practice, and um, volunteering. So, with no further ado, please welcome me in joining Dr. James Collins, who will present his talk entitled Social Determinants of the Racial Disparities in Adverse Birth Outcomes, Zip Code Eclipses Genetic Code. Dr. Collins? Hey, good morning, everyone. Irene, thank you very much for that warm introduction. I appreciate it, and I wish I was able to speak with you guys directly, but you get your first virtual fist bump of the day. I look forward to sharing with you my perceptions of uh, the social determinants of the racial disparity and adverse birth outcome. I would like to kind of set the stage first by just kind of reviewing the general epidemiology of infant mortality in preterm birth. Infant mortality, as you are well aware, is defined as the number of infant deaths which occur in the first year of life. A high rate signifies unmet health needs. As you guys are well aware, infant mortality of African-American infants is far exceeds that of other leading racial groups, particularly compared to not only Latinx whites, Mexican-Americans, Asian-Americans, and Cuban-Americans. The vast majority of African-American and white infant deaths occur in the first 28 days and define neonatal mortality rates. This slide shows those rates for African-Americans in red, whites in yellow, since 1950. And we see a dramatic improvement for both groups. This improvement has really come about really since the 1970s with the invent of neonatal intensive care units. If you happen to be a preterm infant, being born in the United States is a great place to be. We have one of the lowest birth rate specific mortality rates in the world. And we see over 90% of the improvement that we've seen in neonatal mortality is really can be attributed to the things that happen in the neonatal to care unit. But despite having such outstanding birth rate specific mortality, a group of infants who weigh less than a kilo will never do as well as a group of infants who weigh more than who weigh more than three kilos because the neonatal mortality rates are more defined by birth rate distribution. Unfortunately, Low birth weight infants account for about 8% of the births in this country, and yet two thirds of the deaths. And approximately 66% of these infants were born less than 37 weeks, and by definition are preterm. Only about 
1,500, excuse me, only about 40,000 infants a year are born with a birth weight less than 1,500 grams, and they account for about one and a half percent of the births, but yet half of the deaths. Essentially, all these infants are preterm. So from a public health perspective, we could reduce the number of low birth weight, particularly very low birth weight infants, we'd have a dramatic improvement in overall infant mortality rates. This slide looks at a seven decade trend in low birth rates in our country. And we see that for both whites and African-Americans, rates have been flat. If you look at very low birth weight, that is those with a birth weight less than 1500 grams, things have been flat for non-Latinx whites, but for African-Americans rates have been gradually rising. When I first started my investigational career in this, I thought this was all gonna be driven by socioeconomic status as measured by either education or by occupation. This slide shows that the racial disparity in preterm birth rates exist among women who are college educated. The y-axis is preterm birth rates. The x-axis is maternal education in years. We see that for both African-Americans and whites, preterm birth rates tend to decline as a maternal education level if something close related to it improves. However, even among women who are college graduated with masters, PhDs, and doctorate degrees, we still see a persistent racial disparity. Approximately 25 years ago, the big thrust was this all to be explained by prenatal care. This study looks at the racial gap in prenatal outcome among infants conceived by assistant reproductive technology. That's interesting because by definition, everyone who conceives with assistant reproductive technology has access to top shelf prenatal care. You have a group of women who are exceptionally invested in having a healthy birth outcome. But even among this select group of women, we see that there's racial disparity in term low birth weight, preterm low birth weight, and very low birth weight infants. We know that maternal age is associated with birth outcomes. This slide shows that maternal age-related parents of low birth weight differ by race. We see that among whites, rates are highest among teens and then gradually decline as women enter optimal childbearing age. In stark contrast among African-Americans, low birth rate rates are actually lowest among teens and then gradually increase with age. This is be defined as a weathering pattern. But most importantly, we see that the racial disparity is actually widest among women of optimal childbearing age compared to teens. If we look at preterm birth, we see a very similar pattern for whites. Namely, preterm birth rates are highest among teens and gradually decrease. For African-Americans, rates tend to hover independent of age, such that again, the racial disparity is widest among women in their 20s and their 30s compared to teens. Because of the things that I've just presented, women who were born preterm, who survive, who then conceive 20, 30, 40 years later. If we look among African-Americans and whites, a greater percent of African-American women were actually born preterm themselves. In this case, we see that less than 30 weeks, we have a palpable group of African-Americans compared to very few whites. For those moms who had a birth weight, excuse me, who were born themselves at 30 to 33 weeks, we see again, a pre egg hump for African-Americans compared to whites. If you look at late preterm, that is 34 to 36 weeks, again, we see a greater percentage of African-Americans with themselves born preterm. The reason why this is important is we see that early preterm birth rates do vary by maternal's gestational age. We see them among African-Americans in blue, among what in whites in red. Again, the horizontal axis is maternal gestational age in weeks. The vertical axis is early preterm birth rates, that is less than 34 weeks. We see that for African-American moms who themselves have, were born at less than 30 weeks, their rate of early preterm infants is significantly higher than moms who were born at term. If you look for whites, we see the exact same pattern that moms who themselves were born less than 30 weeks have a higher rate of early preterm birth compared to white moms who are born at term. And then if we look at the extremely early preterm, that is less than 30 weeks for those moms who did survive and then conceive some 20, 30 years later, we see again, among African-American moms who were born, excuse me, non-Latinx moms who were born less than 30 weeks, about one and a half percent will have a early preterm kid compared to moms who were born at term. We see the exact same pattern among African-Americans. 
we suspect that this reject reflects a genetic component of gestational age across generations. But we see that the disparity still persists among moms who were born themselves at term. Transgenerational factors are defined as those factors, conditions, environments experienced by one generation that relate to the pregnancy outcome of the next generation. For African Americans, slavery is the ultimate transgenerational process. During the approximately 400 years that African Americans have been in the United States, unfortunately, about 62% of that time is spent in slavery, and this created the slave health deficit. The next subsequent 100 years, about 25% of our time in this country, we had virtually no citizens' rights. This meant that the slave health deficit was uncorrected. It's really only been in my lifetime that we achieved most citizenship rights, but clearly we still have disparate health status, outcomes, and services. Clearly for the 100 years that we've been in the United States, it has been a struggle and we see this in health disparities and equities that persist today. We thought back in the day, and the day in this case would have been, I think 1997, it would be interesting to compare the outcome of African-Americans, or should I say moms who were black, who were born themselves in Africa, who came to the United States today. They haven't had this 400 year generational exposure to racism. What is their pregnancy outcome? compared to Af US born blacks and US born whites. We obtained the vital records of approximately 3000 African born blacks who delivered in Illinois over a 15 year period. And as an epidemiologist I have to show one bell shaped curve and this is it. Don't look too hard because if you look among US born whites and African born blacks, that bell shaped curve is very similar. Whereas US born and blacks, that curve has shifted downward by about 260 grams. But we know the mortality is in the tail and bell-shaped curves aren't good for the tail. So we look at the tail among low-risk women, we defined empirically as those who are college educated, married to college educated men, said they didn't smoke cigarettes and they received adequate prenatal care. We see that among US born and blacks, this very select low-risk group had a very low birth weight rate of about 1.3%. Most striking, we see that African and Blacks, their very low birth weight rate was 0.4%, which is very similar to the 0.3% of youth born whites. We control for other risk factors, this disparity actually went away. So clearly African born Blacks have a birth outcome similar to US born whites. When this study was published, there were two theories that came about one was the genetic code theory. We got a lot of pushback that black women who immigrate to the United States are intrinsically healthier and therefore a better outcome than those who don't migrate. That is probably true. But there's also the zip code theory, which we put forth, namely lifelong residence in the United States or something closely related to it is detrimental to the birth outcome of African American women. We did a subsequent study and we found that those women who themselves are born in Africa or the Caribbean came to the United States, grew up in the United States, had babies, their birth outcomes actually favored parallel that of the US born black population. That is the favorable birth outcome quickly disappeared among US born descendants of foreign born black women. Clearly genes do not change that quickly while environmental exposures can have an immediate impact. Taking a step back and looking at black race as a social context of what it is, we recently did a study which is in press looking at the infant mortality rate of births to Latinx women. We used the national data set of infants who were born in the United States over a two year period. And we found that among US born Latinx women, those who self identified as black had a higher infant mortality rate than those who self identified as white. We looked among the foreign born group, we finally found no difference. So we suspect that again, this US born group, we don't know if they've been here for one generation or for 12 generation, but clearly race is having a bigger impact on this outcome, for this outcome. This slide looks at low birth rate rates of Latinx women using a very similar data set, this time looking at a birth outcome of low birth weight. And we see among the foreign born group, those who self-identified for black had a slightly higher low birth rate than those who self-identified as white. But when we control for traditional risk factors, this gap went away. For the US born group, again, the gap was wider, 
when we control for traditional risk factors, this gap persisted. So clearly, black race is a phenomenon that's having an impact that's driven by social mechanisms. For the rest of this talk, I'd like to focus on four things. Neighborhood poverty, racial discrimination, job strain, and partners' low socioeconomic position, and looking at it all from a life course conceptual model. And our underlying theme is that each of these contribute to increased allostatic load and stress among women who are Black in the United States. First, we'll start with neighborhood poverty. This slide looks at lifetime neighborhood experiences in Chicago. Clearly, are very different depending upon your race. For whites, we see that almost 84% have a lifelong residence in high-income neighborhoods. Only about 2.3% of African Americans live in such favorable conditions throughout their lives. In contrast, nearly 80% of African Americans in Chicago have a lifelong residence in low-income neighborhoods. Only about 2% of whites live in such poor neighborhoods. And that kind of parallels with what's going on in our country, in our city, which is probably similar to a lot of major cities, including Philadelphia, neighborhood gun violence. This slide looks at gun violence by neighborhoods in Chicago. The darker the color, the higher the rates. And we see that the rates are highest on our west side and our south side. This slide looks at low birth rate rates. Again, the darker the color, the higher the rates. We see very similar overlap between low birth rate rates and gun violence. This slide looks at race specific low birth rate rates by lifelong residential environment, again, for Chicago. We see for African Americans with lifelong residents in low income neighborhoods, they had higher rate of low birth rate compared to those who had lifelong residents in high income neighborhoods. The exact same phenomena, actually stronger happen among the white population. But clearly, racial disparity persists for those who have lifelong residents in high income neighborhoods in red. But as you know, the relative risk is one thing, but really from a population perspective, prevalence has a bigger impact. And the population of triple risk takes into account the prevalence and the relative risk. And we see that for whites, despite the risk factor for poor outcome being higher, the population of triple risk of neighborhood poverty with respect to low birth weight, preterm birth, and being growth retarded was less than 5% for the white population. For African Americans, reflecting the high prevalence of poverty, the number of the percentage of low birth weight infants are attributable to poverty, low birth weight infants specifically higher at 25%, preterm birth at about 10%, growth retarded at about 26%. So from a public health perspective, we see that neighborhood poverty is having a greater impact for the African American population because of the increased prevalence of poverty among African Americans, not because of the increased relative risk of poverty. We asked a question, to what extent is African American women's upward economic mobility across their life course associated with birth outcome? We used the data set of infants who were born in the, in the Cook County area, and we had access to their birth records when their moms were born and when the infants were delivered. And this slide shows that upward economic mobility from early life residents in impoverished neighborhoods is associated with lower preterm birth rates among African Americans. The x axis is maternal upward mobility. For those moms who had no upward mobility, that is, they lived in impoverished neighborhoods their entire life, we empirically define poverty as the first quartile. Median family income of that was approximately less than 22000 a year. We see that for those who had experienced low, things came down. For those experienced modest, things came down a little bit more. For those who had high upward mobility, as they went from the first quartile to the fourth quartile. Fourth quartile, median family income was in excess of 100,000 a year. You see a palpable decrease in preterm birth rates. Upward mobility, however, is associated with improvement in the distribution of individual level protective factors. Maybe that's what led to an improved outcome. We see that the incidence of teenage moms declines. We see the incidence of college education rises, incidence of marital status rises, the incidence of non-cigarette smoking wasn't high to begin with, but actually, I mean, it wasn't too low to begin with, but rose. And the incidence of adequate prenatal care also increased with upward mobility. 
This slide looks at the stratum specific odds ratio for the relationship between maternal upward mobility and preterm birth weight by age. And we see that for African American women who are in their teens who had low, modest, or high upward mobility, these odds ratios approximate at one. However, for women who were 20 to 35, those who had low, modest, or high upward mobility, those odds ratios were significantly less than unity, suggesting that upward mobility was having an independent effect in terms of birth outcomes as measured by preterm birth of independent of age. We see that this slide looks at impoverished born African American women, and we see that upward mobility is associated with lower preterm birth rates independent of maternal education. Maternal education less than 12 years of age versus 12 years of more, excuse me, I said age less than 12 years. We see for those who had no upward mobility, who also had less than 12 years education, preterm birth rates tend to decline. For those who had some college education, we see again, a very similar pattern such that in both groups, upward mobility was associated with a decreased risk of preterm birth, suggesting that mobility in itself, independent of age, is associated with preterm birth. We look at prenatal care. We know prenatal care is important for improving birth outcomes, but we see even among women who received inadequate prenatal care, upward mobility was associated with a decreased risk of preterm birth. Clearly, adequate prenatal care also is associated with a decreased risk of preterm birth if moms experience high, excuse me, low, moderate, modest, or high upward mobility, suggesting again that upward mobility is associated with lower preterm birth rates independent of prenatal care. Interestingly, we found that upward mobility from early life impoverishment was not associated with lower preterm birth rates among former low birth weight mothers. Moms who themselves had a birth weight less than 2,500 grams are shown in white. Moms who were non-low birth weight with a birth weight in excess of 2,500 grams are in red. And we see for that both groups, upward mobility really had effect only, excuse me, for moms who were themselves non-low birth weight. For moms who were low birth weight, those preterm birth rates hovered between 20 and 23%. For moms who were themselves non-low birth weight, things were 20%, came down to 16%, down to 15%, down to 12%. We did some fancy multi-level logistic modeling among former low birth weight and no, non-low birth weight impoverished African-American moms to see if we could better tease this out. And we see that the adjusted odds ratio of preterm birth among former non-low birth weight moms who are aged 20 to 35 years Low upper mobility was associated with statistically decreased risk of preterm birth. Modest upper mobility, the similar phenomena. For those who had high upper mobility, the association was even stronger. In stark contrast, the adjusted odds ratio for preterm birth for former low birth weight moms who were between age 20 and 35, those odds ratios approximated one. Low, modest, and upper really had no effect whatsoever. So we paused and thought, let's see what happens when we're looking at another birth outcome, this time being growth retarded, that is having a birth weight less than a 10th percentile. And this slide shows that upward economic mobility for early life residents in impoverished neighborhoods is associated with lower SGA rates among African-American women in Cook County. Very similar pattern that we saw with preterm birth rates. Again, if you had a lifelong residence in impoverished neighborhoods, preterm birth rates were very elevated, almost 20% but came down pretty palpably as women experienced upward mobility. But the exact same phenomena happened that for moms who themselves were low birth weight, those odds ratios approximate at one. We speculate that this reflects fetal programming. That is moms who lived in impoverished neighborhoods when they themselves were fetus, they were, came out small, it also predicted their increased risk of having a preterm or SGA afferent some 20 to 34 years later. This phenomenon of fetal programming acts at the level of DNA in a phenomena called epigenetics. Researchers have used low birth weight as the major marker of aberrant fetal programming. We speculate that aspects of mother's social environment may subject her to influences during fetal life, results in her slowed growth in utero and also programs her to have her preterm or SJ infant as an adult. Clearly, more work needs to be done to tease this out. 
taking a side step, we looked at upward mobility. We asked a similar question, to what extent is white women's downward economic mobility across their life course associated with birth outcome? We found that affluent born white women in Chicago, downward economic mobility was an independent risk factor for infant mortality. We see that for those who experience no downward mobility, that is, they stayed in the fourth quartile or that very affluent quartile their entire lives, their infant mortality rate was very low at five per thousand. For those extreme, who experienced moderate to extreme, that is, they went from the fourth quartile down, down to the second or the first quartile, those infant, that infant mortality rate was 14 per thousand, essentially approximately that of the African American population. This slide shows that downward economic mobility is associated with increased preterm birth rates among affluent born white women in Cook County. The X axis is downward mobility, the Y axis is preterm birth. We see for those who had no downward mobility, preterm birth rates stayed low at 5.4%. For those who experienced slight, things rose a little bit more. For those who experienced moderate, things increased even more. For those who something major must have happened, they went from the fourth quartile down to the first quartile, that preterm birth rate essentially doubled. We had a small number, but that was statistically significant. Interesting, we had a very smaller number of those who had lifelong impoverishment, 69, too small to do anything with in terms of statistical analysis, but for comparison, this rate, again, approximates that of the general African-American population. So lifelong poverty is bad independent of race, and downward economic mobility we see here is also an independent risk factor for poor outcome. The elephant in the room in all of this is racism. And we suspect and wrote that understanding the US born black women's pregnancy disadvantage requires an analysis of the effects of race as a social construct, thus addressing racism in its various forms. If we had to categorize racism, we could put it into two big categories. One is structural slash institutional. Second is personally mediated. It's been a tough year to two years in, our life in this country. Hatred has affected America's heart and the hate is spreading into our intellect, our economics and our politics. The results of this disease, the death of George Floyd in Minneapolis, the shooting death of an unarmed jog jogger in Georgia, the false accusations of a bird watcher in New York City. About a year ago, we thought if we could answer a question, do states with more killings of unarmed black people have larger racial disparities in preterm birth? Interesting, the mapping police violence database actually collects data on police killings of unarmed black people of unarmed people in general. And we obtained five years of this data, excuse me, six years of this data. And we empirically define, if you're in the category of states that had no killings, we call that quartile zero. The other four states were divided into quartiles one through four. Data was extracted for single births for non-Latinx white and non-Latinx African-American women from 2018 from the CDC. We looked at racial disparity in states who either were zero or one and compared it to those who are in quartiles two to four. The analysis were repeated using quartiles of police killings rates of unarmed black people to, again, to scale for those states are gonna have more or less black people in those states. This slide is kind of tough to follow, but it kind of summarizes our findings. 1.5 was the median disparity for this data set. Everything to the left means that the disparity is less than the median. Everything to the right means it's higher than the median. We had 49 states. I think Wyoming was the only state that didn't have enough African-Americans to calculate a preterm birth rate. But you get the feeling that for states that are in the zero category, their values for the racial disparity are less than 1.5. For those who are in quartile one, you also get the feeling that those values are also less than the median of 1.5. When we compare this group with those in quartiles one, 
excuse me, quartiles two, three, and four, these are less than these. Another way to say it, these are greater than these, which gives a suggestion that again, states with more killings of unarmed black people have a larger racial disparity in preterm birth weight disparities. We hypothesized that this discriminated behavior of police officers reflects structural racism and state culture, which serve as upstream causes of health inequities due to differential access to health promoting environments. Redlining is a practice of denying or charging more for services such as insurance, banking, access to health care, or employment to residents and often racial determined areas. The term is refers to the practice of actually taking a red pen and marking a red line on a map to delineate what banks would not invest. But this is not something that just happened back in the day. In 2015, the United States Department of Housing and Justice announced a $200 million settlement to the Associated Bank over redlining in Chicago and Milwaukee. And they found that mortgage loans were denied to African-American and Hispanic applicants between 2008 and 2015. Mendez et al, using data from Philadelphia, accessed home mortgage data and created redlining indexes for census tracts in Philadelphia and appended a relatively small pregnancy cohort to that sample. Nafas found that African Americans were twice as likely to be denied a mortgage loan compared to white applicants, independent of annual income, loan amount, gender, and they were more likely to reside in redlined areas. As a follow-up to this study, we had hypothesized, we had, had a hypothesis that the redlining index could be used as a measure of institutional racism that correlates with other indices of segregation. We hypothesized that residents in redlined neighborhoods is associated with higher rates of preterm birth independent of loan amounts, neighborhood income, gender, age, education, and marital status. And this slide summarizes that our first hypothesis was true. We see that African American to white loan denial ratio, purple is very high, green is high, moderate is red, low is blue, empirically defined using Mendex as index of less than 1.4. We see that for neighborhoods that had a low proportion of African Americans, approximately 4% had a very high denial rate, about 28% had a high denial rate, and about 51% had a moderate denial rate. In stark contrast, for those that had high proportion of African American communities, we see that essentially no one had a very high rate. The high rate was minuscule, 2.6 compared to 28, and the moderate rate also decreased from 50 to 43 percent. And those who were low or no redlining, we see that that was 54 percent compared to only about 8 percent in the low proportion group. Again, our second hypothesis was also confirmed. We found that mortgage discrimination was indeed associated with preterm birth for African American women in Chicago. This x-axis is redlining index, and we see that preterm birth rates tend to climb as a redlining index rose. And we did some fancy statistics and found that there was a modest association with adjusted odds ratio of about 1.3 if you lived in a redlined area compared to if you lived in a non-redlined area. Spatial social polarization. Over the last several decades, American neighborhoods have undergone a phenomenon called spatial social polarization. It is defined as a segregation within a society that emerges from income inequality displacements, resulting in differentiation of social groups from high to low income. Neighborhoods of extreme wealth and extreme poverty have grown exponentially, reducing the size of middle income neighborhoods. And not surprisingly, this change has not been distributed evenly by race. Picture is worth a thousand words. This slide shows us changes in wealth and poverty in Chicago. If we look in 1970, we see this dark blue is a very high income area, really kind of limited right along the lakefront. The low income is the dark red here, oranges. And we see this again, mostly in the west side, near west side, near south side. And the middle income group, the tan, is the vast majority of Chicago. However, with time, we see changes such that most recently, this area has 
grown in size. Look how much blue is here compared to 1970. But now look how much poverty we also have, how much this has grown in size. And the middle has declined. So we've undergone spatial polarization in Chicago. So essentially it's a tale of three cities. City one, the dark blue, is essentially majority African-American. City three, the red, is essentially majority African-American or Latinx. And the middle income is getting squeezed. Index of concentrations at the extremes is a metrics used to compare communities suggesting directional tendency towards an extreme of deprivation or privilege. There's a fancy mathematical model, which I cannot tell you about, but we knew some people who could um, interpreted this for us and actually use this so we can actually measure ice indexes. Thanks to recent publications here, recent studies suggest that this metrics can usefully and feasibly be employed for public health monitoring, including the examination of structural barriers to healthy outcomes. We looked at Chicago, we looked at index of index of concentration on extremes, looking at household income and race group stratification. And we see that for the green group, which are the wealthy white group, compared to the red group, which is the poor African-American group, we're gonna compare birth outcomes in the neighborhoods. And not surprising, we found that preterm birth rates vary by the ICE quintile, quintile, five. So we see that for those who were in the Worst category had the highest overall preterm birth rates, but also had the highest early preterm birth rates. As the index of concentration declined, we see again overall preterm birth rates declined, but most palpably, this early group also decreased. Clearly, more work needs to be done, but this gives us an objective measure to try to get at the impact of neighborhood and health. Personally mediated. A little bit more straightforward in terms of its ability to be measured. We asked the question, to what extent are African-American women's lifetime exposures to perceived interpersonal, interpersonal racial discrimination a risk factor for preterm birth rate? We interviewed a group of women who delivered in one of three hospitals in Chicago. And we asked women who delivered preterm low birth weight infants a set of questions. We interview moms who were determined non low birth weight a set of questions, and we compare the two. And we found that moms, again, African American moms who were preterm infants, more likely to experience racial discrimination across their life course, finding work at work and at school. Minimal differences in the public arena and no differences in the medical arena. We kind of summarized things here and found that moms who delivered a preterm low birth weight infant had greater odds of preterm birth compared to moms deliver term non-low birth weight infants. This is a retrospective study with a lot of the complications of a retrospective study. Sample size is small, but since that time, there have probably been over two dozen studies that have been confirmed, that have confirmed the findings and expanded the findings. I think the best is most usually done by Paula Brevman and her group out in California. They surveyed over 2,000 African-American women and over 8,000 non-Latinx white women who deliver single human birth over a three or four year period in Cali. And they found that 37% of African-Americans versus 6% of white women reported chronic worry about racial discrimination. Interestingly, they found that chronic worry about racial discrimination was associated with preterm birth weight among African-Americans with a relative risk of two. Interestingly, they found that the racial disparity in their sample was attenuated and became non-significant when adjusted for chronic worry. The unadjusted relative risk was 1.6. When they controlled for the chronic worry about racism, that decreased to 1.3, and statistical significance was lost. Job strain. There was a study back in the day, day being defined 2007, that women in Quebec who were employed in positions characterized by high levels of job strain, high demand, low control, sounds like fast food McDonald's to me, experienced about twice the risk of preterm birth. A similar study done in Connecticut with a bigger data set with dependent job characteristics found that preterm birth was significantly associated with jobs that allowed little control for the employee. We went back to our data and looked at some of the questions. And we looked at about two thirds of our women were employed during pregnancy 
and they were employed as clerks, cashiers, and receptionists, and educators, and they reported that chronic worry was interestingly related to birth outcomes. We asked 10 additional questions, responses were dichotomized after the collections into non or chronic. Chronic we defined a few times a year, a few times a month, or at least once a week, or heaven forbid, nearly every day. To give you some idea, here were three of the questions. You'll watch more closely than others because of your race. Whites often assume that you work in a lower class job than you do and treat you as such. You're treated with less dignity and respect than you would be if you were white. In summarizing the findings, moms who live with preterm very low birth weight were more likely to experience one or more compared to moms who deliver term non-low birth weight, three or more. Seven or more, we didn't have statistical significance, but it kind of shows that chronic exposure to racial discrimination is associated with poor birth outcome among African-Americans. Fathers. Maternal child health, similar to this talk, is really focused on the social determinants of birth outcome as measured by women's characteristics. However, the socioeconomic and cultural landscape of African-American fatherhood suggests that the role of paternal socioeconomic position may be particularly relevant to the racial disparity in birth outcome. We know that college graduation rates for African-American men, I mean, about graduation college attendance rates for African-American women are abysmal compared to African-American women, compared to anybody. Uh, we know that unemployment rates are sky high. Um, and as my brother and attorney tell, reminds me, incarceration rates are sky high for African-Americans uh, compared to whites. So this study, I think, is important. I mean, it rates importance, I think, as much as that 1997 study did looking at women who were born in Africa. This slide looks at the excess excess preterm birth rate for US born black women. And we found that fathers matter. So we use national vital records. And if we look at the disparity, this time we're looking at US born blacks versus foreign born whites. And we see that this gray, this 2.4 numbers aren't important, but this is gray unexplained because this is vital records. No big surprise. There's not information about neighborhood income, job strain or racism on vital records. But if you look at this light blue, other variables, prenatal care, interpregnancy interval, things like that are important and explain a palpable amount of the disparity. This part in red here is 1.19 is maternal education. We know that that's important. But interesting, paternal involvement. In retrospect, I don't think we should have said involvement, but we just say paternal, call it what it is, paternal acknowledgement on the birth certificate, explained a greater proportion of the disparity than maternal education. This is using Wahika analysis to try to get at this disparity. If we look at the disparity between US born black and US born white, again, preterm birth, we know that the vast majority is unexplained, but if I draw your attention to the red, which is maternal education, we know it's very important, but look, dads matter. This has a similar, if not a greater impact than maternal education. We were struck by that. This slide looks at the excess preterm birth rate among US born compared to foreign born and black women, the role of father's education. And if we look at paternal education, which ranges less than high school, high school, GED, some college, bachelor's degree, or master's or higher, we see that for both US born black women and foreign born black women, preterm birth rates decline as dad's education rises. We, again, did some fancy Wahika analysis with modeling again, and we found that among this group of women with acknowledged fathers, paternal education was explaining a significant percentage of the disparity, which we think is important. Education is reported in the vital records most times, I use myself as an example, is my wife. She reports education. And there can be some maybe objective, maybe subjective change of what education is. So we actually try to get something more objective. And we use paternal lifetime socioeconomic position, which we, we defined as dad's median family income in the neighborhood when he was born and median family income 
of his neighborhood when his child was born. And we see that we found that for dads with a lifetime residence in low-income neighborhoods, first-year mortality rates for their infants was sky high at 13 per thousand. And for those with a lifetime high, that was almost cut in third, down to 4.9 per thousand. This slide looks at paternal lifetime social position and low birth rate rates, and we see the exact same trend as dads' social position improves, low birth rate rates decline. This slide shows among African Americans that lifelong social socioeconomic position is associated with low birth rates independent of maternal education. Dads with a lifetime low in white, lifelong high in red, and we see that in both groups of maternal education, dads with a lifetime low had a higher rate of low birth rate than dads with a lifelong high. Even among the college graduated group of moms, we still see that dads are having an impact. If we look at preterm birth, we see a very similar trend. Infants born to dads with lifelong low have very high preterm birth rates compared to dads with lifelong high. If we look among the early group, we see that the disparity is a bit wider at 3.9% compared to 1.4%. If we look at race specific early, really defined less than 34 weeks by acknowledgement and by socioeconomic position, we see a very interesting phenomena. We see that for African Americans, that rate of preterm birth, really early preterm birth is almost 7%. For those who have acknowledged low, things came down to 4.3. For those acknowledged to the acknowledged high, things come down even more to 2.9. But sometimes you gotta look at the end. Look at the end here, 22,000 of our data of this group were not acknowledged, and only 360 were acknowledged high. If we look among non-Latinx whites, we see the exact same trend, namely non-acknowledgement, dead non-acknowledgement is a risk factor for preterm birth, and dads with a life acknowledged high, SEP, have a very low birth rate. But we see that these ends are pretty palpable, uh, and this end is relatively low. If you look at the distribution of selected pregnancy risk factors, namely smoking, inadequate prenatal care, and poor weight gain by, by paternal acknowledgement and SCP. We see that for African-American moms, for those who have now acknowledged, about 60% that had one of those risk factors compared to 43% if you acknowledge low, 3% if you acknowledged high, and the exact same trend happened for non-Latinx white moms. So we know that, or we suspect that dad's socioeconomic position and acknowledgement increases economic contributions to the family, and it also provides social support to the family. But we thought, let's measure something that we can measure, or look at something we could measure, namely smoking, inadequate prenatal care, and poor weight gain, and we see that as dad's acknowledgement and SEP deteriorated, the incidence of these risk factors rose. We did some fancy modeling again, and we found that again, among African-American moms, the pregnancy-related risk factors, namely poor weight gain, inadequate prenatal care, and smoking, accounted for about 25% of the explained disparity. We controlled for all the risk factors, such as age, marital status, and education, that minimally changed down to 21%. If you look among non-Latinx whites, the exact same trend occurred, namely about 20% of the difference we found was explained by poor weight gain, inadequate prenatal care, and smoking. Hi, Dr. Collins. At, Sorry, yep. we have about five more minutes. I want to make sure that you get to your break. So I just want to um, time check. Thank you. Oh, perfect. We'll get you, we'll wrap this up in the next five minutes. Um, if we look at paternal low versus high, we see the exact same trend. Minimally changed with control for traditional risk factors, having a bigger impact among African Americans compared to whites. So, in summary, that preterm birth is the tip of the iceberg. We talked about just a couple of things, paternal low socioeconomic position, poverty, not acknowledgement, job stress, including the big thing, racism, are all what's underlying this glacier. There are a few things that we haven't spoken about, which also contribute to preterm birth. So much information. What do we do with what we have? What challenges do we face? One, historical insults contribute to current disparities. Until the effects of past historical ills are undone, disparities will not be eliminated. 
Two, social factors are the largest contributor to disparities, but often ignored. Medical, molecular, and biological factors get the most funding. Three, we do not consistently distinguish between health care disparity and health disparity. Differences in medical care is only one of many contributors to overall health disparities. So if we're serious about improving outcomes, we have to go ecological. We have to begin to address the social and economic inequalities that are the root cause of health disparities. And I think what we have to do is put structural racism on the agenda. That is name racism as a force determining the distribution of other social determinants of health and routinely monitor for differential exposures, opportunities, and outcomes by race. I want to leave you, leave you with my favorite, favorite poem. Let America be America again. Let it be the dream it used to be. Oh, let America be America again. The land that has never been yet and yet must be. The land where every woman is free. Thank you very much for your attention. And I look forward to hearing some of your questions and hopefully I can provide some answers. Thank you very much. Well, thank you so much, Dr. Collins. I know one of the, the, the many detriments of being on Zoom is that you don't get to hear kind of the roaring applause for such a well, um, just, just a the depth of insight across all of kind of the social structural context support around kind of these racial inequities um, and especially kind of rooting into racism and structural racism as that driving cause. So we have many questions. I will um, answer uh, or ask you a few. And okay. for everybody on the call, um, we'll try to collect the rest of the questions. Um, and if Dr. Collins has the ability um, have him answer them offline so that we can have the, the wealth of voices again heard um, for this presentation. But I did want to start off with what I think is a conversation bridging from what you mentioned and kind of thinking about next steps. Um, one of the questions that came in is, um, thank you for your presentation. Health departments rarely have power over income inequality, housing segregation, and uh, many of those contextual factors around um, those, those elements driving these racial inequities. So how can our research move the needle on these macro factors in, um, instead of focusing on individual level or proximal factors? And I would also add, what are kind of the openings um, that may be kind of uh, leverage points based off of the year that's happened, based off of what's coming um, on, the, on the forefront that we might be able to leverage in you know, integrating this, this research into action um, on a broad based level? Yeah, I think somebody hit the nail on the head. I think that's just so important. I think given the events of the past year, I think what we can do is partner across disciplines. Um, I think if we just use um, gun violence, um, and we can even go further upstream and look at uh, gun violence, police officers against African-Americans, all these upstream factors, um, we really haven't tied them into how they impact health. And I think part of it can be to educate the public that these events have negative impacts on health and that we can partner with um, different disciplines, sociologists to try to address these issues which are pertinent for health. Um, and I think in partnering with that, one of the things that I think would come across with, with um, people who are on the ground is looking at resiliency and looking at neighborhoods that are resilient and what can we do to try to build up resiliency because clearly I understand that improving poverty and all that's going to take a long generational type of a, of a yardstick to see measurable improvement but what can we do to at least make it so that we can better contextualize the, uh, um, the lives of African-American women and help them to take control of those birth outcomes in the neighborhoods that they reside in. Well, great. Thank you so much. Um, we are at 12 o'clock and um, we just really want to thank you for your time, your dedication to this work and kind of the, the, the kind of 
deal setting work that you've continued to do across your career. Um, and one of the main questions that we got were, were these slides, will these slides be shared? Um, because again, there's such a wealth of research here and a wealth of insight. And the record, the webinar is being recorded. So the, they will at least be available there and we'll reach out to others um, with if, if there's other kind of ways that you would like to access the slides and access again, this wealth of knowledge that Dr. Collins has shared with us today. Yes. Yeah. So okay. I would like to thank everyone and also give adequate time for Dr. Collins, your break. Um, hopefully the insights kind of set, set here, um, give us a, a wealth of, of gristle to chew on, a wealth of things to wrestle with as we, as a public health community, really dig into um, both in Philadelphia and nationally, how do we unpack um, the racism that's at the root of the context of um, racial inequities and maternal and, and birth outcomes for our Black, Black people in America. So thank you, Dr. Collins. Thank you all attendees. Again, we are collecting your questions and yep. we'll try to answer them offline, but yep. we really appreciate your attendance and your attention um, and your interest in this, in this area. So thank you.